Hi everyone, it's Stephanie Weaver. I'm here in the blue and yellow kitchen with Microwave Boy on the camera, Daisy the Golden Retriever on the floor laying watch, and my guest today is Lisa Braxton. Hi Lisa. Hi Stephanie, I'm very happy to be here. Well, we're, we're excited to welcome you. Lisa is the author of The Talking Drum, a piece of literary fiction. She's an Emmy-nominated journalist with an MFA, Master's of Fine Arts in Creative Writing. And uh, though um, Mafe is a peanut stew or a groundnut stew from Senegal, I've got some avocado oil heated up and I've got chicken that I'm going to, uh, chicken thighs, boneless, skinless chicken thighs that I'm going to toss into the pan here. And we're just going to do a quick sear on these. So while I'm doing that, Lisa, tell us briefly the setting for your book. This is going to be too. Is this going to be too loud? Yes, yeah. that's Yeah, talking drama is about three young couples in the late 1970s and how their effective urban development program comes in and takes over an immigrant neighborhood. The setting in the fictional city, Delaware, Massachusetts, along the eastern seaboard, uh, north of Boston. And I'm featuring these three couples, Malachi and Sydney, the other couple who have come to Belport to open up a cultural bookstore. And uh, they're going to live on the top, on the top floor, standard bookstore on the lower floor. Kwame and Della live across the street. Kwame and Malachi were best friends, but they've kind of grown apart. And um, Della doesn't know if she can really trust uh, her boyfriend, Kwame. He's got his hands in a lot of different areas. He's good in with the mayor, he flips properties. Runs a record store, but he disappears at times. She's wondering whether or not she can trust him. He seems so much she. And then there's Omar and Natalie. Omar is a West African, a Senegalese drummer, and he and his wife have some friction. He's from West Africa, she's African American, and they're realizing their differences as this great development project um, begins to get underway. He does not believe that the um, the uh, power structure will take over their neighborhood, and but she does believe that she's rather cynical, perhaps, but she's a she's a, an American, and so she's a different point of view. And the fault lines in their relationship come clear, become clear as the story proceeds. There's also an arsonist who is running around burning down properties. So uh, as readers are reading it, they're wondering what in the world is going on. Who's burning down properties? What's going to happen to all these people in my story? Yes. Okay. So. Um, just so those of you who are watching, trying to figure out, while Lisa was talking, I was realizing that the sizzling was going to be way too loud for us to hear you. <laughs> so I was rearranging where the pan was. Um, but I think we kind of caught the overview, which hopefully everybody heard. It's three couples. What year is it again? Remind me. Oh, it's, it's in 1971. So okay. around the era of the, uh, the height of the, the Black Arts Movement, the Black Power Movement. Um, Dr. King was, was, was shot just a few years earlier. So there's a whole lot of tension in that neighborhood and a whole lot of um, the, uh, the idea of black solidarity is really big. And that's a big part of the novel as well. Great. So we have these three young couples. And where is the where is the town? It's a fictional town. A fictional town, I would say it's a fictional town north of um, Lynn, Massachusetts. Okay. So it's um, up north of Boston. It's on the harbor. There's a harbor involved in the story as well. So it's a uh, maybe, uh, maybe half an hour from New Hampshire for people who work okay. with the uh, English geography. Okay, great. So um, tell us a little bit about where the genesis of the story came from. Because I think you initially said you, you had an idea about two, a man and a woman in a bookstore. So tell us about that while I stir the chicken. Yes, I uh, had a story with a, a scene of um, a woman who were they were dating years ago, and she wants to get back together with him. And so she finds out where he's going to get this bookstore to get this coffee at the cafe. And I had seven pages, which were going nowhere. So eventually, I entered an MFA program at Southern New Hampshire University, and the professor is taught me how to write a novel, how to be disciplined, to sit down every day and do some writing, writing 30 to 40 hours per week. I get organized, and I just plotted along step by step, adding more characters, and all of a sudden the idea of urban development came into my head and gentrification. I think largely because I uh, watched my parents who owned who opened up a books of not books, sorry, opened up a clothing store in nineteen sixty nine and as a child I worked in the store with them and I could see where as time went on when the uh, factories left the city and crime went up 
and that the city fathers and mothers decided that they wanted to try to take some of the waterfront multifamily houses, tear them down, and redevelop it to make it more attractive to people who have money. And that affected my uh, parents' customer base, so they lost a lot of customers. And the waterfront was clear, people were moving away, and it was decades before development actually happened. And so consciously, I think that was in my mind. But also, the church that I go to in Massachusetts, um, I, the church is in a, what was a black neighborhood, which during the late 60s, the Massachusetts Turnpike was expanded and actually cut through that black neighborhood. So a lot of people who lived there had to had to leave. It was unfortunate because there was um, un, un, um, segregation by another name. It was, a, it was kind of hushed, hushed up. But when those individuals tried to move to other parts of that town, no one would bond with them, with them buy, no one would rent to them. So it really destroyed that black neighborhood community that was so important to the fabric of their lives. And so both of those experiences that I heard about or experienced myself through my parents, that was on my mind when I was writing the talk drum. Oh, that's great. So um, thank you. That was such a, I can tell you're a journalist because that was such a succinct overview. So um, so just so you all know what I was doing off camera, uh, I, I pulled the chicken pieces. That we just needed a light sear on them in avocado oil. And then I pulled them out into the bowl that they were in raw because I'll they'll be cooked again. Uh, added the uh, a little bit of chili flakes. So uh, Senegalese food is pretty spicy. And the nice thing about cooking for yourself at home is you can gauge how much spice you want to add. So I only used a quarter teaspoon of the red chili pepper flakes, but you can certainly add more if you like more heat. And then three bay leaves and the diced onion. And I'll be sharing the link to the recipe for this mafe. So um, so that's that's going to just cook for a couple minutes. And then we're going to add jalapeno, garlic. We're going to add the chicken back in, tomato paste and then some water and it's going to stew for about 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll add the peanut butter and um, the additional pepper. So um, I wanted to just let you know what was happening on the stove. And um, so we know wh where the book is set, we know who it is and kind of where your inspiration is. So tell me, um, I, you sent me an article about your parents and their store and you know, the thing that I loved about reading the book was it took me into this other world that I, I actually grew up not that far from where Lisa grew up, um, in Stanford, Connecticut, and, um, and I wasn't aware of the black community, and I wasn't aware of urban renewal. I didn't need to be, you know, as a white girl in a, in a you know, my part of town. And so it was really interesting to me to think about that this was probably happening in my town. It happens, has happened all over the country. And, um, but that, you know, the, these black businesses that were such the core of these communities. So do you want to talk a little bit about your, your parents and their experience and your experience and how that informed some of the things that happened in the book? Yes, uh, my parents grew up in Virginia, the uh, Shenandoah Valley area. Beautiful area, but uh, they grew in the 40s and 50s, and um, there was very uh, strong fit to Jim Crow in that area. There were separate big people that went to separate schools. They would often tell us, my sister and me, stories about how they would have to step off the sidewalk when a white person was coming in their direction and to put their head down. Uh, just very subservient, yes ma'am, no ma'am. They wanted to eat at a restaurant, they had to go to the back door to be served. They were inclined to purchase something in the store. White individuals could cut ahead of them, and they could not say anything going to the back of the bus. All those things, which I feel, um, no question, uh, led to the, the need or the feeling of, for black solidarity. So when they moved to Bridgeport, it, wasn't, it was not much better. It was different, but it wasn't much better because my, my mother is telling me stories about how she would uh, try to get clerical work she would call the phone and they say, well, come on down and fill out an application. She'd get there, they look at her in, um, you know, wide eyed and said, wide eyed, and they say, well, that job is filled. That happened over and over again to my mother. My father found work at General Electric, and he was there for many, many years. My mother also worked there as well for a while. She worked at a curtain factory for a while. 
And at that point, my father really wanted to fulfill his childhood dream of opening up his own business. And my mother was reluctant, but she finally came around and she agreed and they opened up the Braxton's Med Shop, which um, was really was featuring the finest in men's fashion. So it opened up in a, a pretty much a, what had become what used to be a, a white ethnic neighborhood, but because of suburban flight and just changing the neighborhood, it became more of a, a black neighborhood in San Latino. And so there were a number of black businesses along that strip. My parents' store was when I was growing up. And there was a sense of pride among the black, black residents that there was a, a black business owner running a clothing store. And uh, there were some black owned restaurants, an ice cream shop, and uh, a black owned uh, dry cleaners on that block. And so there, and a lot of people would come into the store, my parents' store, not just to shop, but to talk about politics, talk about the issues of the day. And um, that led to my father becoming the NAACP president for a couple of terms, and also um, he was on city council for a term. So some of those things do uh, play into the talking drum, where you, you see where my main character, Malachi, the husband, who wants to open up this, um, this um, bookstore, cultural center, he wants it to be the kind of place where people come in and talk about politics, where people come in and have intellectual discourse where they put on skits and plays and, and have um, writing contests as a contest for, for kids and allow the young black poets to come in to speak. So a lot of that, um, what I experienced growing up, did play into the novel. That's great. So uh, I just added the chicken and the tomato paste back into the pan. We're going to give it two or three more minutes, and then I'll be adding the water, the salt, put the lid on and we'll uh, let it finish cooking just so y'all know what I'm doing I'm off off screen normally we show a little bit more of that but we're kind of improvising today uh, 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 just how everything's gone today which is fine because uh, we're having fun so um, so there's in writing in, in the fiction there's uh, plotters and pantsers there's people that plot out their whole book in advance and then there's people who kind of write and then they figure out what the story is which camp do you fall into Lisa? I actually fall into both camps okay. because I, <laughs> I was just kind of um, pantsing along when I first started. I had these, like I mentioned, the two individuals in the bookstore, the bookstore and she wants to be in the, the cafe. And then I added a drummer. I knew the drummer was going to, I thought he was going to live in the basement of um, this of, um, bookstore. Once I realized that I wanted the two people to be in the bookstore, then I added another person, then another person. But then, um, working with the professors at um, my in grad, in grad school, they said, well, you really need to, need to stop and write a bio on each character. And also, uh, just to use index cards and, and just plot out what you want to happen in the novel. So at first, it was, it was really a mismatch of uh, just letting, just stream of consciousness, and I'm throwing out hundreds of pages that weren't working, but eventually <laughs> I began plotting it out because I really didn't to know what was going to happen. Otherwise, I would have never, I would have never, never produced a publishable sure. book. Well, and I'm laughing with you, not at you, because I've certainly <laughs> produced many, many pages of things that have never seen the light of day. So it's just kind of nice to know that I'm not alone in that, and that you know that that the process. I think as we go along, and then we write the next book and the next book, it starts to get a little bit more clear. Uh, but I love that you're sharing your process because I think that's really interesting. So, um, so because this is a fictional world, you had to create a, a town, a, a couple of neighborhoods, and um, and all these characters. How did you go about researching and building that world? Because I find that really interesting. I um, actually uh, picked up a big uh, piece of board at um, the craft store, and I created a map of the town showing um, the old port, the town, and then the neighborhood of Petite Africa that's going to be taken by urban redevelopment, and Liberty Hill, the other neighborhood. And I showed all the streets and uh, the, the little businesses on these streets because I had the characters moving around quite a bit on the bus or walking here and there. And at the point where I could keep pretty good. I had to go ahead and map that out. And I also had to map out the house where the bookstore is. I got floor plans of Victorian houses and I drew out 
the, the floors and the furniture and everything. So I would keep it straight as I was writing so that the reader could visualize what I was showing in my words and of course make sense. So that was part of my process. That's awesome. And that makes so much sense because it does it is a really rich world. So let's talk a little bit about the two neighborhoods. So you have Petit Africa, where which is primarily Senegalese folks live. And that's where uh, some of the action, and certainly where the mafé is served, is at the restaurant, the Lebea um, Bob restaurant. Um, and then there's the, uh, is it Liberty Hill, the other neighborhood? Yes, it's called Liberty Hill. Okay. And that neighborhood is uh, mostly, it's become mostly African American, and these are people who are doing pretty well. They're opening up businesses, and um, they are pretty much separate from the people in Petite Africa where there are people from West Africa, people from the Caribbean, and uh, of like Latino individuals as well. So the, the lifestyle in East Africa, those individuals kind of sneer, sneer at the people who are in uh, Liberty Hill, and the Liberty Hill people do the same thing. They kind of look down at the people of East Africa. So you've got two different worlds connected by a bridge over Belfort River, but they're very, very different neighborhoods. Yeah, and I thought one of the things that your book brought out that I thought was very interesting was the um, the culture of recent African immigrants versus African Americans who, um, and, and they kind of look down at each other for different reasons that, um, that the recent African immigrants are saying, well, you don't want to have, you know, have one of these black American women as your wife because they're flighty and they're this and they're that. And I thought that was very interesting because I think certainly white Americans don't necessarily see the nuance in the black community or the African American community. And I thought your book did a really great job of exploring some of those differences. Yes, um, and, uh, several people have remarked on that. And in fact, I, I have my, I, I'm part of a book club through my church and we had our book club meeting yesterday and we talked about the talking drum and one of the members of the book club, she's African American, she was saying, that uh, years ago she and her husband took a trip to somewhere in Canada and they went to a museum and there was a, a black guard in the museum where they were talking to and he was asking them, where are you from? And they mentioned they were from Philadelphia and he said, um, and he was African, he said, oh, we, we look down on people who were um, the descendants of slaves and they couldn't believe that he said that to them and she had explained to him that, well, you know, slavery, and he's, he was from Liberia, that's where he was from. And she explained about the history of slavery in Africa and how many African kings and chieftains uh, participated in slavery. And so it's it's, you know, it's been all around, and it doesn't make sense to to uh, you know look down on each other. And my point, with, with what I was what I wanted to say through the book is that uh, the people of the African diaspora, where you know we are brown skinned people from, if you go back far enough, we're all from the same part of of, of West Africa. But yeah, with these divisions, and I'm hoping that through the novel, people will talk about these issues. We talk about it because I, I hear it all the time, I see it all the time. It's very frustrating that um, that there isn't more unity. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I think, uh, and I, that's what I think the power of art has is you know this isn't a prescriptive book. This isn't a how-to book or a book that's trying to convince people of a particular point of view you're being drawn into a world, you're meeting these characters, you're rooting for them, you're wanting them to succeed. Some very difficult things happen to some of the characters. And you know, you're know you on their side. And so you can see the different points of view and it illuminates that without it feeling like someone's teaching me something, which you know not everybody's super receptive to that. So I think the beauty of art and, and fiction is that it can illuminate some of these larger issues without them seeing, seeming like you're, you know, you're lecturing people or something. You're bringing out these differences, and I also appreciated that you weren't afraid to have uh, some of your black characters um, not be good people. Like there's some people that are doing bad things in the book, and you mentioned arson, and then there's uh, there's another set of characters that turn out to be uh, uh, not, you know. Uh, take, they take advantage of, of some of our lead characters. And, you know, I think that, uh, that I appreciated that because I felt like it showed a depth of range of people within the African-American 
and the immigrant com community that I thought was very rich. Yeah, I think it's important to show uh, the dimensions of, of characters, the dimensions of people, because it's just like in real life. They're like the, the company you're referring to, the tailors. They're people who are very sharp and smart and, and culturally aware and very well connected and very helpful, but they can also be criminals at the same time. Right. And that's the way people are. I mean, they, nobody is an, an entirely good or bad. And I think that I would have done a disservice to the story if I made all the individuals good people because, I mean, just purely good people because we're not, we're, we're all different things. We're all, we have different, all different dimensions in our character. And I think also people wouldn't have been as interested in the story if, if the individuals um, had not been multidimensional. 100%. So we're going to take a very quick taping break. Uh, we'll be back just in seconds through the magic of video editing. While the uh, mafe cooks, we'll come back when it's finished and we'll wrap up with Lisa. So just hold your thought right there. We'll be right back. Okay, so the mafe is done. Let me show you what it looks like up close here. Up close and personal. Oops. I'm totally angling it the wrong way. There we go. Um, and then I'm going to show Lisa. How pretty is that? So that looks very good. It looks very really good. good. So we waited a little bit longer. Um, so the recipe that I'm going to share the link for calls for three cups of water and covering the pan, which seemed like a lot of water and then to cover the pan. So I left my pan uncovered and I just kind of kept an eye on it. And then once I added the peanut butter and the peppers at the end, I just kept kind of adjusting the heat and stirring it to get it to this sort of nice, saucy quality. So, Lisa, you've made mafe once, is that right? Yes, I did. What happened was um, I found out that there was a Senegalese restaurant about 30 minutes from me in Boston. <laughs> I went there and I uh, ordered mafe, loved it, and then decided to make it myself. And I found myself in the kitchen chopping up all these carrots and, and peppers and tomatoes and all kind of whisking the peanut butter and all those things. It was a, a pretty big project, but it was a lot of fun. And I use lamb, or my, I love lamb, and I, I use lamb for it. It's very succulent, and it came up very, very good. It was very tasty. Beautiful. And so this dish is, uh, it's native to Senegal, Ghana, Gambia, um, Nigeria. We did have a Nigerian um, her heritage black chef on the show a little while ago, did you see Lutosin, and he talked a little bit about mafe. So it has to be made with peanut butter. So it can't you can't substitute a different nut butter and have it be mafe. This that's the um, and it is traditionally served over rice. So we have some um, and the thing I learned from that chef is I was not rinsing my rice enough. So I rinse my rice now about six times until the water is completely clear. And then I get this beautiful, fluffy texture on the rice where every grain is separate. And it just makes the food so much better. So I'm going to take a quick taste. And let's talk about why the book is called The Talking Drum, because we did not cover that, Lisa. It's called The Talking Drum because the owner of the, the, owners of the bookstore, the husband, Malachi, wanted to harken back to the African villages where the talk, where the drum was used to signal people to come together for rites of passage, for a birth, for a marriage, uh, for a very important meeting. And also, my drummer in the novel, Omar, uh, his, his best friend is a drummer as well. They have a group together, and Kadeem, his friend, plays the uh, talk and drum very well. And it's a drum that he does, he sweeps it under his arm, he takes a mallet and hits it, and that drum sounds like it's talking. So I have two different references to the talking drum in my novel, The Talking Drum. Nice. And is that the, the djembe drum? Is that the one that's called the talking drum? No, no. the djembe is not the talking drum, but actually the, the djembe, I found out, is really fascinating. It's, it's one of the most popular drums in West Africa. It's also featured in my book. And there's a lot of spiritual qualities to the, the djembe. Um, the, the blacksmiths would traditionally go into the forest to ask the tree for permission, the spirit in the tree for permission to cut down the tree to make the drum. Then the carver carves the drum and they make sure it's, it's fitting for that particular drummer. And they use um, animal skin for the, the face of the drum. It can be a rabbit skin or, or kangaroo skin or goat skin. And the spirits of all of those things are in the drum. And that's what the belief is that the drum is very spiritual from very Different, different parts of the making of the drum was 
very spiritual instrument. Oh, that's beautiful. So, um, so I just want to tell you what this tastes like because uh, it's delicious, and I recommend you try it. Um, the recipe that we're going to share from a blog is um, is not terribly time consuming. So it's onion, red, red bell pepper, you cut up a jalapeno. Um, that's pretty much all the prep. So it's pretty simple. And then I I just use uh, kitchen shears to snip up the meat, so I don't have to get a whole uh, knife and uh, cutting board dirty. And then the only other tip I'm going to say is I, whenever I use bay leaves in a recipe, I always use three because then I know I have to find three and pull them out. <laughs> and if I always use three, then I know I haven't missed one because they can be very sharp if somebody ends up with one in their, um, in their butt. So it is super creamy, super rich. The peanut flavor is very forward. Um, this is not super spicy. My, apparently my jalapeno from my garden happened to be a not very spicy one. So I can definitely see it could have used a little bit more heat, but it's got this very warm quality. And you can tell regardless of which meat you use or if you decide to do, I suppose, a vegetarian version, it's so hearty because of the protein from that, um, from that legume, that uh, peanut. So we wanna uh, just encourage you to give it a try. Um, one of the things I've loved about doing this series is that I'm meeting people I wouldn't have met, I'm reading books I wouldn't have read otherwise, and I'm definitely tasting foods that I wouldn't have eaten otherwise. So I really encourage you to do that because it really opens up our world and to other cultures and helps us understand each other better, which I think is an important goal for fiction and, and art as well. So uh, Lisa, you can find her, uh, it's, it's lisabraxton.com, correct? Your website? Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes it is. Lisa Braxton, B-R-A-X-T-O-N. And we'll have a buy link for the talking drum. Uh, you can find it on, online. Try to support local bookstores. If you want to support a black-owned bookstore, they're happy to order books for you and ship them to you. They don't have to be in your neighborhood. So you can do that as well if you're interested in, in supporting people in that way. Lisa, I want to thank you so much for sharing your art with us and I wish you all the best with the talking drum. Thank you so much for being here on the Blue and Yellow Kitchen. And thank you so much.